Um, I just wanted to appreciate everybody who is here in the audience um, meeting with us today. Um, and I will just take a very little time so uh, to introduce uh, uh, Dr. Bloom here for a moment and just remind you that this is a two-part series and we're going to have another talk um, that is given by Ruth Reitzman, who is our very own, very awesome FVCC professor, and that would be at noon on the 16th coming up next week. And the link is also wherever you found this link, the link is provided at, as well there. So I just want to tell you, my name is Gerda Reeb, and I uh, organize the Honor Symposium here at FVCC. The Honor Symposium has been ex in existence for 27 years, and not even a pandemic can make us stop to have it again. So um, obviously, I was not related to the Honor Symposium always, but now it's a great honor to do so. So we have a lovely speaker here today. Um, Dr. Marshall Bloom is joining us from the Rocky Mountain Labs, where he is uh, one of the directors. And um, he works directly under Anthony Fauci. Do, Dr. Fauci, am I understanding that correctly, right? And we also had him here about four years ago when we did not know what is going to happen at all. And we had him here as part of the Honor Symposium was, that was dedicated at the time to pandemics and people. And at the time, you might recall the Zika virus was circulating. And um, then the topic at the time was, you know, what kind of pandemics are we seeing in the future? Of course, we had no clue, no discussion about COVID at the time, right? And you had a few guesses on what might happen. Then you had your March Madness picks. And today we have Dr. Bloom back here. He's a very accomplished scientist. And he is here to talk to us about a little bit about the pandemics of yesterday, today, and tomorrow, sort of a historical look. And we're going to look closer at the virus variants and at the different vaccinations next week when Dr. Reitzman will present. So I will now hand this over to Dr. Bloom. And hopefully, you can tell us a little bit more about your research because you have there's so many big words that I don't even know how to pronounce them. Yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. It's, it is, uh, I remember driving up there to the college just about four years ago. It was in March. And I'm trying to remember if there was that much snow at that time. I honestly can't remember. But you're right. The, the pandemic of the day then was Zika. And we've come a, a pretty, not a very good way, but we've certainly come a long way. So what I'll do is I'm gonna show slides uh, and let's hope to God that they work. They did a minute ago. So here we go. If, I'm, if I might just also say that we're gonna keep questions. You can submit those in the question chat feature and I'm going to try to read most of the question. We have to end exactly at seven, but I'm gonna try to get to as many questions as possible and read those back to Dr. Bloom. So I'm just going to mute myself for the time being. Okay. <clears throat> well, I already told you who I am and you know where I work, Rocky Mountain Labs down in Hamilton. Um, and as uh, Gerda noted, uh, Dr. Fauci is my boss and he actually presented a lecture uh, just a couple of weeks ago, the Mansfield lecture, uh, which was on video and 6,500 people uh, watch that. It was uh, more of a fireside chat. It was really a lovely, a lovely event. And I can tell you, he really enjoyed it. So this is, uh, for those of you who may not be that familiar with Rocky Mountain Labs, uh, we're located in the Bitterroot Valley, just about four hours, three and a half hours uh, south of where you are, straight down Highway 93. And this is our campus uh, right now. We have about 500 people, although a fair number of them are working at home, uh, teleworking at the moment. We have 21 principal investigators, or that will, those would be professors in the university department. And we have a lot of support people, technical, animal care, administrative, purchasing, security. And we work on a vast array of bacterial diseases, viral diseases, and diseases called by prions, which are these goofy uh, proteins, which are infectious. And we work at biosafety level two, biosafety level three, and then biosafety level four. 
And level four is where you work with Ebola virus. Level two is where you work with Zika virus. And it actually turns out that the coronavirus, uh, uh, this coronavirus that I'm not going to talk much about, but uh, you'll hear more about next week, is actually a biosafety level three virus. And our focus here is on emerging infectious diseases and pandemics. And this building right here, can you see my pointer, Gerda? Okay. All right. This building right here. So my office is, I'm sitting actually right there. And this grayish building, taller building here, that's where the biosafety level uh, four facility is. And for those of you at the college, we do do tours, although we're not doing them now uh, because of the pandemic. So if the college ever wanted to get together uh, a group of adults or students and come down for a tour after the pandemic is over, that would be lovely. <clears throat> and um, we've been, and when I say we, I mean they uh, have been, and our predecessors have been studying uh, what we call emerging infectious diseases for over a hundred years. Uh, you can trace our antecedents back to Rocky Mountain spotted fever uh, over a hundred years ago. And these are just a few examples, yellow fever in 1942, and then the Lyme disease, the Ebola virus disease, the Zika virus, all those pandemics, we've worked on those. They've worked on those. Every time I say we, I mean they. And uh, just to give you a little homework, and I have a little bit more at the very, very end. This is a really good book, which I think now that we've really gone through a pandemic, uh, people will really appreciate this book. It's by David Quammen, who's a writer from Bozeman. <clears throat> and he wrote a book called Spillover. And spillover is the term for when animal infectious diseases spill over into human populations. And it's estimated that about 70% of the infections that people get derive from animal infections. And we're gonna say a little bit more about that. And then there was this movie a number of years ago called Contagion, but you don't have to watch the movie now because you can see exactly the same thing on CNN every night about how a pandemic evolves around the world, but it's still a very good movie. Um, I just wanna start with a few definitions <clears throat> that if you don't learn anything else from uh, my presentation, I hope you'll remember some of these. And these are my definitions. You're not going to find these uh, in the Encyclopedia Britannica. So we talk about established infectious diseases. So these are diseases that are well known, well described, and reasonably well understood. And a good example of that uh, is norovirus. And actually, another good example of that is uh, measles and pertussis. An emerging infectious disease is a disease that is identified for the very first time anywhere, or a disease that pops up in a new geographic location, or a disease that has been present at very, very low, insignificant levels, but rapidly reaches significant levels. And examples of that are actually Ebola virus and then of course the coronaviruses. Uh, and re-emerging infectious diseases are the re-emergence or reappearance of known diseases that have been dormant or under control. And examples of that are measles. Those are, uh, uh, measles is a virus, pertussis is a bacteria. We know a lot about them. We have wonderful vaccines against them, but people don't take the vaccines and they keep re-emerging. And then zoonotic infections, I mentioned this, this is a disease that spreads from animals, and this includes everything from arthropods, ticks, fleas, and mosquitoes, all the way to, to non-human primates or monkeys, it spreads from those animals to humans. And of course, they can go through intermediate animals on the way. And as I said, 70% of our infectious diseases probably arose from animal diseases. And a good example of that is bubonic plague. Some of these diseases still cause illness in the animals, and plague is an example of that, and Ebola virus is an example of that. But some of them have adapted so well to people that they no longer infect, uh, infect animals. An outbreak <clears throat> is a sudden unanticipated increase in the cases of an infectious disease in a relatively small geographic area or group of people. These are sometimes called clusters. An epidemic 
is a sudden, a sudden anticipated increase in the cases of infectious disease in a larger particular geographic area. And a pandemic is an epidemic that spans multiple countries or continents. And an important thing to remember is a pan, just because it's a pandemic or an epidemic or an outbreak doesn't automatically imply that that's a particularly fatal disease. It just denotes the scope of those infectious diseases. And then spillover, we always already mentioned. And then fomite, this is a word, wonderful word. And this means an inanimate object that can spread infection. One of the most common ones, of course, is a doorknob. Uh, we probably get a lot of colds from touching doorknobs and then putting our fingers in our eyes. That's a fomite, okay. And I wanna have come to the re recognition, recognition over the last couple of years that pandemics are really just a special class of emerging infectious diseases. So when we talk about emerging infectious diseases, we're really talking about potential pandemics. Pandemics are gonna arise from emerging infectious diseases. And boy, have there been a lot of pandemics through the, through the centuries. This is a, a graphic I took from the Washington Post a couple of weeks ago, which goes way back to plagues from, and you know, and they go back even farther, but these are the ones for which we have some sort of description. And you can see they killed a fair number of people. Uh, the Black Death, which was a bubonic plague in the 14th century, and if you ever read Barbara Tuchman's book called A Distant Mirror, she talks quite a bit about this. And uh, it was estimated to have killed about 75 to 200 million people, which was a substantial fraction of all the people alive. And then when the Europeans invaded uh, North America, they brought with them <clears throat> a variety of infectious diseases, which decimated the North American uh, indigenous population. And, and and here in the new in the new world, smallpox uh, was thought to have is thought to have killed somewhere in the neighborhood of about 55 million people. And at the time that Lewis and Clark actually came through North America, it's estimated that over 70 percent of the Native Amer of the indigenous peoples at that time had been killed by viruses which were introduced in the 15th century in Central America. And then we can go on the 1918 the SARS epidemic, coronavirus, less than a thousand people died, MERS, Ebola, and so forth and so on. So there are a lot of pandemics through the ages. And there are some great books written about this. These are, this is a picture of that Dr. Fauci lets me use of emerging and re-emerging infectious diseases from all over the world. Some of these are not really uh, at the pandemic, at a pandemic level. But you can see the red ones are newly emerging ones. And like Ebola virus, for example, was unknown until the mid 1970s. Uh, and now we, now we know a whole lot about it. And then uh, the re-emerging ones we mentioned, and then the black ones, what Dr. Fauci calls deliberately emerging infectious diseases. These are diseases that emerge because somebody puts them there. That's bioterrorism. Luckily, we haven't had uh, many uh, instances of that. And were I to draw a circle around the infectious agents on this table that we work with here at Rocky Mountain Labs, it would be about 70% of them. So we are here in Montana at Rocky Mountain Labs, a huge repository of investigators and expertise on uh, emerging infectious diseases. Very, very uh, concentrated and group and very, very uh, densely studied. So why do these infections emerge? And if we simply think about the coronavirus, which Ruth is gonna talk about next week, and I'm gonna briefly mention, you can see some of these things. Okay, encroachment on wilderness habitats that harbor vectors of new infectious agents. There's a terrific article in the Missoulian today about a professor at Montana State University named Raina Plowright, which talks about this. Climate change population growth and crowding. As people and animals get more crowded, diseases have a better chance to take off. International travel. This is a no brainer that with people traveling around the world, an infectious disease can be there today and here tomorrow. 
Worldwide transport of animals and food products, we've seen that. Changes in food processing and handling, this sort of relates to the coronavirus, the current coronavirus, COVID-19 outbreak, which is some people suspect started uh, at a, what's called a wet market where wild animals were sold for food. Changes in human behavior. HIV is a good example uh, of that and, and the hepatitis viruses as well. Decreasing vaccination rates and declining support for public health. This is really a horrible phenomena that we are experiencing here in Montana and elsewhere during um, the current pandemic. Support for public health has never been wonderful and it, our legislature now is trying to emasculate the public health uh, powers that our public health officials have. That's gonna turn out, I think in the long run to be a very, very bad idea. And then political instability and disinformation. Dr. Fauci always likes to say we have two pandemics. We have the real pandemic, and then we have the pandemic of misinformation. The pandemic about the virus is pretty easy to deal with. The misinformation pandemic is much, much harder. And then finally, pets can, can uh, and animals uh, can uh, uh, play a role. We've seen in the current coronavirus pandemic that the virus, that people, people, infected people can bring the virus onto a mink ranch and then what's called a spill back, infect the mink, the mink become very, very sick, and they can then transfer it to new, uh, to new people. So animal, domestic, I guess I should really say here, domestic animals uh, instead of pets. And of course, as you can appreciate, multiple, many of these factors can interact at the same time. But as, we go, as I go through the list of, of pandemics, just reflect <clears throat> on how these factors in disease emergence are playing a role. So to me, the most horrible pandemics are the ones which are preventable by vaccines. And this is a slide which is about three or four years old, but it hasn't gotten any better. Here, this is measles, okay? completely preventable by vaccination. And yet there are large outbreaks all over the world. And in the last three years or so, we've had outbreaks in the United States at Disneyland, in some uh, Orthodox religious communities in New York and other places, largely because people don't get vaccinated and they don't trust public health. Mumps, German measles, polio is almost eradicated, but not quite. And then we here in Western Montana, we have our own almost continual vaccine prende preventable pandemic of whooping cough or pertussis, completely preventable by vaccinations. This is really appalling. And then let's just look at a few of these pandemics and see if we can learn anything from them from the past. <clears throat> so HIV, that was discovered in the 1980s, and Dr. Fauci was one of the major players in the worldwide uh, fight against AIDS, and largely due to his efforts and all the research and public health and sociology that he was able to get done, that has gone from a disease which in the 1980s was a death sentence in about a decade to the point now where a person who's diagnosed with HIV and stays on their HIV therapy, they can basically live a normal lifespan. So this disease has really been converted from a deadly pandemic into a, a manageable chronic uh, disease, almost like diabetes. Influenza is, I call it kind of the gift that keeps giving because it seems like there's always a new influenza virus popping up somewhere in the world. And, we, and internationally, there are a lot of surveillance mechanisms with the World Health Organizations and the various CDCs to try to look for new influenza uh, viruses that emerge uh, and uh, might cause serious outbreaks or even pandemics. And flu viruses come in a variety of flavors called, H stands for one of the virus genes called hemagglutinin, N stands for neuraminidase. And these are the two genes by which virus, uh, flu viruses are categorized. And we've had all of these have the potential, uh, have emerged and have the potential to become very serious. In fact, today, although not this year, 
we can expect about 500,000 deaths a year worldwide. It turns out that the measures people are using to fight uh, coronavirus, like masks, hand washing, and social distancing, have had the impact of shutting down influenza all around the world, and, in, and as well, some other uh, serious infectious diseases. Uh, but this is every year, and then there have been a number of pandemic flus, the most prominent one uh, in uh, 1918, uh, which was an H1N1, which killed about 50 million people. And the one we had back in 2009, that was, that was related to this virus here. So I call this the gift, the, the virus that keeps giving. Ebola virus disease, that was first discovered in Africa in the mid 1970s. And it was always sort of smoldering small outbreaks or clusters until in the 2014 West African outbreak, the virus because was able to get into a large, large crowded metropolitan areas. And guess what happened? It went from a relatively small number of cases in the West African country of Guinea in a little over a year, bang, to almost 40,000 cases in West Africa. And every province in Guinea, Sierra Leone, and Liberia was impacted. And it's only by dint of effort that these adjacent companies, countries didn't get infected. So this was a place where communication and urban, you can, you can see which of the factors involved in emerging infectious diseases allowed this to become a pandemic. And we had a few cases in the United States of this too. They were imported. <clears throat> and <clears throat> RML workers, uh, scientists from RML, uh, went over and worked in Monrovia, Liberia in 2014, 2015, not taking care of patients, but doing tests on patients from a big Ebola virus treatment unit. And I'm gonna mention Dr. Feldman in a minute. This is Dr. Feldman right here. And in the, the article in the paper this morning, Dr. Munster was mentioned, and this is uh, Vincent Munster right here. So they did somewhere in the number of between two and 5,000 Ebola virus tests when they were working over there. And uh, the folks were so pleased that they made this plaque, which uh, sits upstairs in the building I'm in now. This gentleman here was their driver. They, they were put in a special hotel, isolated from everywhere else. They, in the morning, they went from the hotel to, the, to their lab. At the end of the day, they went from the lab back to the hotel. And as you may know, a vaccine now exists against Ebola virus, and it was tested out during that pandemic, and it's being used now because there's now an epidemic of Ebola virus in, uh, or an outbreak of Ebola virus in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And the guy that invented that vaccine was actually Dr. Feldman. <clears throat> Zika virus, uh, Gerda mentioned, uh, and this was a virus which was discovered in Africa here in, in the Zika forest in the 1930s, but was never thought to be a big deal until uh, the, the, the emergence in the 2016, when it was associated with some horrible uh, neurological defects all over the world. Had it not been for the fact that this virus caused such severe neurological abnormalities in uh, unborn babies who then uh, went on to be born and have basically severe uh, neuro brain abnormalities, this is what we would have classified as sort of a junior, vice, junior varsity virus, but it was nevertheless a pandemic, big impact around the world. And then again, let's just look at this slide right here for a second. And I think what you can appreciate is that really that pandemic viruses are really global citizens. They don't belong to any one particular country. They belong to all of the countries and Global problems like this, uh, like emerging infectious diseases and by extension pandemics require global solutions. All right, so what does that mean? Well, this is a partial list. 
<clears throat> if we're going to address emerging infectious diseases and try to prevent pandemics, these are some of the things that I think we're going to have to do. We're going to have to have continuous international surveillance of sort of these hot spots where it seems like these viruses emerge. It's got to be ongoing. It has to be robust and the results need to be communicated. We have to, we know that these pandemics are going to most almost certainly arise from somewhere in nature due to disturbances in uh, uh, land, land use practices and other things. So we have to do a lot of ecological investigations. And these are themes which if you read the article in today's Missouli and uh, talking about Raina Playwright, right, Plowright, she expands on a number of these. We have to have an urgent, robust response to emerging outbreaks before they take off and spread around the world. That's got to be robust. It's got to be quick. There has to be a coordinated international response. If they're going to be global problems, so we need to have global responses. We have to prioritize immunization programs so that we can prevent uh, dormant uh, and controllable infectious diseases from becoming an issue. And very, very importantly, we have to have international trust international cooperation and international collaboration. If everybody is pointing fingers at everyone else, we're not gonna make much progress on this. We have to trust people and we have to uh, be prepared to collaborate with them, even if we don't agree with everything else that they do. There has to be open international communication. The Chinese published the sequence of, of uh, the COVID-19 virus within about a week of the time that they had it, which was really, really astonishing. And it was that publication of that sequence which made it possible for so many of the advances uh, to be done so quickly. The RNA vaccines were based on the, the virus sequence that the Chinese published. The people at Pfizer and the people at Moderna and the people at NIH who designed those vaccines did not have access to the actual virus before they developed, the, they designed those vaccines. That was a result of open international communication and the rapid sharing of scientific findings and resource, or as my friend, uh, he used to be the president of the American Association for the Advancement of Science describes it, science without borders. And very importantly, all of these things cost a lot of money. We have to be able to, full, to, to shoulder our share of the expense. As, and as a very rich country, we have to be willing to share some of the burden from some of the other countries which don't have that luxury if we're going to uh, uh, impact these uh, pandemics. Now let's talk a little bit about predicting pandemics. And some of you may remember this slide from a few years ago. And it actually turns out that Dr. Fauci is a big fan of baseball. And he wears a couple of masks. He wears one, which is the NIH mask, which looks like this. And he wears another one for the Washington Nationals because he threw the ball out last year. And he also wears one for the New York Yankees. Well, Yogi Berra was a Yankee catcher who had a real way with words. And what he said was, it's tough to make predictions, especially about the future. He said a lot of other great stuff too. So if you look up yogiisms or yogiisms, you'll get a whole page full of wonderful quotes like this. So this is a slide, this is in the next one are the slides that I showed back when I was up in, in Kalispell a few years ago. So predicting pandemics 2017. These were in my informed hunches, probably a virus and a virus that is related to one that we already know about probably originates in a tropical or semi-tropical part of the world. And this was right after the Zika virus outbreak <clears throat> pandemic. So I said, maybe an arthropod vector borne infection like a mosquito. And then I gave my March Madness bracket, yellow fever, which is a, a mosquito borne infectious disease, which caused pandemics around the world up until around the 1800s including in the United States. Influenza, you should always bet on influenza. 
loss of fever, which is an infection in West Africa, Rift Valley fever, which is a mosquito-borne serious infectious disease. And look what I had here last on the list, a SARS or a MERS-like coronavirus. Well, I was betting on influenza at the time. This was my bracket, but I had to put my money on flu. So what happened, I think we all know, Dr. Fauci, just about a year ago, wrote his first article on coronaviruses called Coronavirus Infections More Than Just the Common Cold. And I'm not going to go into great detail about the virus, about the the COVID-19, because Ruth is going to talk about that in great detail. And I wouldn't be able to cram it in and do justice to it. So what you should do, I hope what I tell you, it turns out to be a little aperitif. And then you watch Ruth's talk uh, uh, next week. And it turns out that there are a variety of human coronaviruses. The alpha and the beta coronaviruses are ones that infect people. And these ones, which are highlighted here in yellow and red, these are human coronaviruses which cause common colds. It's estimated that about 15% of the common colds that we get every year are caused by a coronavirus. And this coronavirus right here, OC43, is thought to have arisen. uh, There was a a severe respiratory uh, pandemic or outbreak in the late 1800s, which was called the Russian flu. And a number of scientists feel that the Russian flu was actually a a, 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 a coronavirus derived from cows, which swept the you know, the, uh, Europe and the United Kingdom at that time caused a lot of deaths and that that virus basically uh, over, the, over the decades sort of cooled off and converted and turned into sort of a common cold virus. So these are the four uh, common uh, coronaviruses. But if we look, as Dr. Fauci says, past his prologue, there were two former mo- uh, more limited pandemics from uh, respiratory coronaviruses, uh, human coronavirus. The first one called SARS, was SARS-1 now, uh, which was in 2002 and 2003, didn't kill a whole lot, a uh, great number of people. And the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, uh, which started off in uh, Saudi Arabia and is still sort of smoldering along. This one is still out there, but it's not highly uh, contagious between people. And then right around the 1st of January in 2020, there were these cases about new human viruses linked possibly to seafood, a new strain of coronavirus as a source of this pneumonia outbreak in January of 2020. And here we are today with the COVID-19 caused by SARS coronavirus type two. This is a micrograph of the virus and these, Gold things represent viruses coming out of a cell, which the virus has killed. And about a week ago, this is where we were in the world. And this is really, really dramatic. Almost 115 million cases, and the US is still number one, uh, but it looks like Brazil is gonna give us a good run for our money. 28, almost 29 million cases, the US has had a half a million, over a half a million deaths, over two and a half million deaths. This is a week ago, uh, worldwide. And if you look at sort of the epidemic curve here, you can see where we started, how we really blew up around the world. And now it looks like it's looked like it was starting to come down, but people are waiting to see what happens here. Because as some of the states and the governments are saying, we're tired of this, we're going to open up, take off your mask, go to the bar go to Florida for spring break. We're gonna see what happens to this curve. This is in the world and you can see there are cases just about everywhere. And in Montana, you know, we're we're doing pretty well too. We've had 100,000 cases, uh, 100,000 cases as of the second and and 1,400 deaths. And here's what our curve looks like. This looks pretty promising too. Of course, we have people that say, you know, this thing is a hoax. I don't believe it really exists. It's it's no worse than a common cold. This virus has killed the equivalent of half the people in the state of Montana. 
So how someone can be aware of these numbers and claim that this is not an issue or look at these numbers in the state of Montana, 1,372. I bet you half the towns in the state of Montana have fewer than this many people in them. So this is a big deal. And, you know, and there are ways to compare it. One of the ways, this is a slide I got from Dr. Fauci too. He gave me this slide in January and I had to make the, the COVID-19 bar bigger. Uh, but you can see that more people have died of this than in World War II. And in fact, all of the other wars put together and we're closing in, although I don't think we're gonna get there to the 1918 influenza pandemic. So where did this virus come from? Well, initially, people blamed this cute little mammal called a pangolin, which is an anteater. And then other people thought, well, you know, we think it's a horseshoe bat. And they're called horseshoe bats because their mouth and nose parts look kind of like horseshoes. Well, this one, it's not this one. If you go back and look at this graph again, here you can see where the MERS virus is. This is like a family tree. This is coronavirus type one. So the closer these things are to each other, the more closely related they are. So you can see that the SARS coronavirus type two is most closely related to a bat coronavirus, which is called RATG13. And the pangolin viruses are not quite as close. So the money now is that this virus came from a bat coronavirus. Some people think this was a deliberate release or an accidental release from a laboratory. You can never exclude something like that, but I think uh, most of the credible scientists that I know view that as very, very unlikely. This virus arose in nature. And the clinical presentation, we all pretty much know about that. Fever, loss of taste or smell, and people will tell you, I was sitting there drinking my coffee and all of a sudden I couldn't taste it anymore. I mean, just like that. Cough, fatigue, uh, what put me in the hospital was a headache nausea, dom, dom, vomiting, and diarrhea. And it's not a trivial infection, uh, but disturbingly, and this is a very, very sneaky virus that we're learning more and more about, it's estimated that a third of the infections with this virus, the people that get them, never know they're sick. And three-fourths of individuals who have a positive PCR test when they get tested in an asymptomatic tested program will remain asymptomatic. So what this means is you can go into the grocery store and you could be sitting there looking at the tomatoes next to somebody who's not coughing, doesn't know he's sick, but is shedding virus. That's why we are all wearing masks. The other thing which is really astonishing is that there are a number of long-term effects of this virus. It's estimated that about 80% of the people who get, who get over this go on to have at least one long-term symptom. And, uh, and there are a lot of them, more than I could possibly go through. Just about every system in the body, people can lose their hearing, they can develop uh, heart, heart problems, they can develop visual problems, they can develop what's called brain fatigue or, or brain fog, chronic fatigue, headaches, and so forth. We're gonna be living with these impacts for a long time. And there are a variety of countermeasures and we study most of these here at Rocky Mountain Labs, but Ruth is gonna go into these, so I'm not really gonna dwell on these. And of course the science breakthrough of 2020 were the vaccines and she's gonna talk, I'm confident, she's gonna talk about those at length. So I'm really not gonna say anything else about them. But what I wanna do is I wanna give you the whole deal in one slide. This is a, a diagram that a friend of mine in Australia came up with. We have to think of each of these intervention me measures as being a single slice of Swiss cheese. Physical distancing, masks, hand hygiene and cough etiquette, ventilation, quarantine, isolation, testing and tracing, all the way up to vaccines. Each of those measures is one slice of a block of Swiss cheese. A little bit of virus can get through any one of these slices. Masks are about 60 to 70% effective if you wear them right. 
The vaccines are about 95% effective, the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccine, but a little virus can get through. However, if you put all these slices together, the holes in the block of Swiss cheese don't go all the way through. So if we're gonna shut this pandemic down, we can't just rely on one slice of the Swiss cheese like the vaccines. We have to use, put all the slices together. An important thing to remember, and I'm sure Ruth is gonna go over this in great detail, the pandemic is not gonna end when people get vaccinated. The pandemic is gonna end when the number of cases of COVID-19 are so low that the virus cannot sustain transmission from one person to another. So the other thing, if you don't remember anything else, remember the Swiss cheese model when you try to explain to people, why do we still have to wear our masks after we get vaccinated? I hope this, and I think this is a, I wish I'd have thought it up, but I, I didn't, but boy, I've sure used it over the last six or eight months. And then because I have to acknowledge, like I know that all of you do, that we're living uh, in Indian country and we're living in the land uh, where the Kootenai, the Pandurai and the Salish uh, were their traditional lands. I want to say a few words about the devastating impact that this virus has had on uh, in Indian country and on Native American populations. And I'm only showing the map of Montana, but the Navajo and uh, uh, tribe Indian nations in other part of the United States have awful, often also suffered uh, severely from this. There are special problems associated with most Native American nations which make them more susceptible to pandemics. They have scattered populations. They have multi-generational housing. So if one person in a house gets sick, a lot of people have the chance to get sick. They don't have good water. That many cases, they don't have municipal water supplies. They have at inadequate uh, sewage infrastructure, lack of communication and connectivity, a lot of serious COVID comorbidities that we know about, obesity, diabetes, and poverty, their tribal health resources are extremely weak. They were given money under the CARES Act, but in fact, they had to sue the federal government to get the administration to release that money. And in this article from the Billings Gazette last fall, uh, there was a Native American uh, uh, um, tribal council member from one of the, either the uh, Northern, I think the Northern Cheyenne, who said, this is the enemy that can't be seen. And the Black Scott Kipp, who's a tribal council vice chair at the Blackfeet Reservation said in November, we look back at what happened to our people all those years back when the smallpox came through. There are so many things going on now that parallel what happened back then. And you remember I mentioned at the start of my talk about the uh, pandemic of smallpox in, among indigenous populations that began when uh, the Europeans invaded uh, the Western hemisphere back in the 15th century. And this is a very accurate and, a very, and something which should make us all very, especially those of us here in Montana where American Indians and Native Americans are, are, are a substantial fraction of our population. We shouldn't be allowing this to happen. But I wanna leave you with one last lesson, uh, one bit of homework, and that's to look at this book, get a copy of this book called Rotting Face, Smallpox and the American Indian. This is written by, this, by a fellow from uh, down in Idaho. And this is actually not Native Americans in our part of the country. This is from some drawings from uh, South, South or Central America. And I learned about this book from some Native American uh, high school kids from Box Elder who came to visit here once. This book tells the story of smallpox and uh, the American Indians and focuses on, and they called it rotting face because I would never show a picture of somebody with smallpox, but it looks like the skin is basically rotting. So they called it, one of the Native American terms for this was rotting face. And there was a big outbreak in 1836 and 1837 in the Mandan Idatsa nations, right where the Missouri starts to make its big uh, curve 
there was a fellow that got on a, a, a steamboat in St. Louis and had smallpox. Got off, but he gave it to somebody else. And a few more times, somebody got off in the middle of the Mandan and Datsun Nation and a huge devastating outbreak of smallpox occurred there. So I think as people who live that we have to acknowledge as people who are living in what were once Native American uh, lands, I think we owe ourselves the obligation of reading this book and understanding what happened and trying to work hard to prevent it from happening again and to try to help not Native American populations, but also all the populations, not only in the United States, but all over the world who don't share all the resources and access to medical care and medical research that we do. And with that, I would like to thank you all for your attention. Uh, I'd like to thank Tony for letting me use a bunch of his slides uh, and some of the people that work for him, Ken Pico who works down here. And I finally wanna note that I, uh, I'm a, a, an employee of the National Institutes of Health. And with that, I am gonna stop sharing Gera and try to answer any questions. Well, thank you so very much. Um, that was really, really interesting, fascinating. I'm sure we have some questions, so please, um, you could type your questions in the que in the chat feature. Um, we have one question here uh, to, uh, first of all, thank you, Dr. Bloom, for your excellent talk. The pandemic of misinformation is disheartening. What suggestions do you have to combat the misinformation pandemic? We could make a lot of money if we knew the answer to that question. I think uh, the uh, I think um, okay, hang one sec. Okay, uh, I think there's the United States has always had a very very strong anti-intellectual uh, bent to it. It goes back to the founding of the country. And unfortunately, this pandemic uh, became politicized. But we have to remember that there's a lot of anti-science and a lot of anti-infectious disease and a lot of anti-vaccine, uh, what they call them anti-vaxxers in the United States for one, for one reason or another. And most of them are beyond my ability to understand. And what I would say is that the way we combat that is, we, number one, we try to set a good example. We try to be respectful to people, although that's certainly a challenge in some cases. And uh, I would recommend a wonderful book, which just came out. It's called The Anti-Vaxxers, two words, A-N-T-I-V-I-X-X-E-R-S. The author's last name is Berman, and he traces back anti-vaccine uh, uh, philosophy and anti-vaccine efforts to the time of Edward Jenner, which was like hundreds of years ago. So sentiments against vaccines are deeply embedded in, in culture, uh, particularly in, in Western culture. And he has some, Mr. Berman has some really good ideas. And I think the information that he provides, it's not a handbook on how to deal with people who are anti-vaccination or anti-vaccination uh, uh, anti or anti-science, but he lays out the history very well and uh, lays out uh, the history very well and will give you insight to talk to people. Now you have, can I comment? What was that? Can you read that to me? Yeah. So the next question was, can you elaborate or exemplify uh, about the use of surveillance as a global cooperation in combating the virus? I believe this was on, on one of your slides. Yes. yes. So the, the wonderful example of that is with influenza. We know that influenza typically is a fall and a winter uh, disease, a fall and winter infection in the Northern hemisphere. So if we look in, and we also know that most of the influenza viruses originate in the Southern hemisphere or near the equator, uh, in, typically in Southeast Asia. So what the World Health Organization, the CDC and others have done, they have set up influenza surveillance systems. 
So they will sample the influenza viruses which are circulating in the Southern hemisphere um, during our summer. And they'll say, okay, these are the ones that are making people sick. We think there's a good chance that these are gonna be the one that are gonna make it into the Northern hemisphere and cause problems. And the, are the vaccines that we get are based on the guesses that those people make. If they guess right, we have a vaccine, an influenza vaccine, which is about 70% effective. If they guess wrong, which sometimes happens, not that they guess wrong, is that the influenza virus fools them and the, another one becomes the dominant one, then the vaccine might be about 20%. So I think what we're, we should be talking about now, now we know that there, we need to worry about coronaviruses because they're respiratory viruses. They can tran they have the potential. We've had three good examples of, uh, of a coronavirus pandemic. I think people need to be thinking about, and, and people are thinking about it. All it takes is money and all those other things I listed for international solutions uh, to start doing uh, surveillance for coronaviruses as well and try to keep an eye out for ones which may be uh, on their way to causing trouble. That's a great question. Our next question is, can you comment about concerns of vaccine nationalism? So what that means is that the rich folks in the rich countries are gonna get the vaccine and the poor folks in the poor countries aren't gonna get the vaccines. And all I can comment about it to say is it's very distasteful. All right, and then our last question so far. So bring it on if you have questions. We have nine more minutes. Uh, can you predict an end to this pandemic? My and I'm going to quote my good friend. date, I suppose. <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to quote my good friend Yogi Berra. Predictions are hard to make, especially about the future. I think uh, we're going to know in the next you know a uh, couple of months or maybe the next couple of weeks if we watch that epidemic curve, if it continues to go down. I think we're gonna be in, in good shape. Dr. Fauci says maybe next fall and, and next winter, but the unfortunate thing, the vaccines are wonderful. The vac, as Ruth is gonna talk about tomorrow, they're extremely effective at preventing severe illness and they seem to be reasonably effective against keeping people from getting infected. Although that data is still being collected, but the thing we have to remind ourselves and our colleagues and the people and our uh, people that we come uh, that we come in contact with are that the vaccines are just one slice of Swiss cheese, and that the pandemic is going to end when the number of cases, when the number of infections are too low for the virus to to, to sustain what are called chain, chains of transmission uh, around the country. I mean, the Centers for Disease Control has already said that uh, two, that uh, groups of adults, because kids haven't gotten these vaccines yet, that groups of adults who have both been vaccinated and fully vaccinated, they can have a party at their house and take off their masks, okay? That doesn't mean it's a good idea to go down to the brewery with all these people you don't know and take off your mask and start knocking down, uh, start knocking down beers. But so I, the, an, the shorter answer is, I can't tell you. And then Ruth is asking, can I tell us a little bit about the research that's going on down here? Well, I, the, I can. We're working on a lot of different aspects now. Uh, early on, some of the most important work on developing animal models was done basically right next door in the building, right next door to me. Uh, trying to develop, because if you're going to develop countermeasures, which means vaccines, diagnostics, therapeutics, all, you know, all these other things, you're not going to really want to try them out in people at the first, right? That wouldn't be very ethical if it's something you don't know is going to work or not. You want to try those in animals. So one of the main things that the scientists here at Rocky Mountain Labs are so terrific at is developing animal models for serious infectious diseases. So a number of the really good, and none of the animal models are really good, 
but a number of the best animal models for SARS-CoV-2 were developed right here at Rocky Mountain Lab, a couple of non-human primate models. And now there's some work going on with some Syrian golden hamsters. We've done that. Uh, we had people working on the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome virus before uh, uh, the current pandemic began. And they had just finished doing some work on this drug called remdesivir, how effective it was against MERS published, they published that result right when the pandemic was starting. And so immediately, the, as soon as the virus became available, the virus was sent here and they tested uh, the virus against, they tested remdesivir against SARS-CoV-2. And as I suspect most of your uh, listeners, your viewers know, uh, remdesivir is one of the drugs which is, is used clinically, including here in Montana, including up in Kalispell, against uh, SARS coronavirus type two in a certain group of hospitalized people. Well, and then I think this might be our last question and we were, I know you need to be done at, at seven. Can you tell us about how long the vaccine effect is supposed to last? Well, that's a terrific question. And the answer is I can't tell you because you have to realize they didn't start vaccinating people with these uh, uh, they didn't start vaccinating people uh, with these vaccine with these vaccines in, in a large scale manner until the fall, and it it's it's clear that the efficacy of the vaccine extends out months. Whether it's going to extend out years or not, that remains to be seen. I mean, uh, uh, one of the things that you have to remember is which is you know, is in a way is a little bit humorous is that a year ago, I would venture to say that a year ago that most of the people in our communities had never heard of this virus. And now everybody is complaining, when am I going to get my vaccination? And that's in less, that's in about a year. And that is Dr. Fauci says it's unprecedented and unpredicted that the, the operation warp speed and you have to give President Trump a credit for, for putting that in motion. Um, uh, and you have to give uh, President Biden a lot of credit for getting the vaccines out, would not have predicted how well those were how well those vaccines were going to work and how quickly they could be developed. And one more question came in. Why has the US done so poorly compared to Australia? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. And you know, there was a story on NPR either this morning or yesterday morning is, you know, why isn't it uh, very bad in Africa where everybody expected it was going to be horrible? And the speculation there was, well, you know, it's a difference in population demographics. Although I have family, uh, my daughter-in-law is from Lusaka in Zambia, the capital of Zambia, and my in-law, and they're not my in-laws, they're my son's in-laws, tell me that it's actually uh, pretty severe there. So I don't know the answer why some countries have done, uh, done better than others. I'd have to really be, and it's, I would say that in all likelihood, there are probably some people who've written good articles and uh, uh, speculation about why that's the case, but I don't know the answer. Well, thank you so very much. And for everybody who is in the audience, I'd like to remind you that on Tuesday the 16th at noon, we are going to reconvene and Dr. Ruth Reitzman will speak to us um, again, this time more about in detail about the virus, the, uh, the variants, who knows, hopefully won't have another one by then, and also the different vaccines um, as they're still emerging, as we all know, because you know it's in everybody's mind. So I thank you all so very much. Thanks for you know, putting up with the one more Zoom meeting, you know, it's just so lovely. And I'm so glad it worked out. I'm so grateful to the college and to our IT team that this worked out. And you are fantastic. Thank you. And have a lovely evening. And I can't wait to have you back here on campus. Let's plan in four more years. Okay. <laughs> and let's hope it's not in the middle of the next pandemic. <laughs> it's going to be all in hindsight, in the rear right. view mirror. Right, right. Thank you okay. so much. I've got to sign off. Thanks very Thank much. You. Thanks. And thanks all of you for watching. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.
Good night.